Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Brothers and sisters, too many attempts. Try again later. This is what my phone says to me after many attempts of trying to let it recognize my fingerprint or trying to put in my four-digit pin. Don't ask me what it is, though. And there's something on my finger or there's something on the screen. And I try and I try and I try. Then it says, too many attempts. Try again later. It locks me out, which is really frustrating when you're trying to put on the perfect song on your streaming service. You're trying to capture the beautiful moment that I am between my kids. Too many attempts locks me out and robs me of my joy. But I know that some of you have worked with computers. Some of you are very technologically savvy. and You know that even when technology is complicated, it's still kind of simple. Your phone is looking for only one or two different kinds of inputs. And as long as you put in those inputs, you will get an unlocked phone or whatever you're looking for. It's just that if you don't, then you won't. So if there's something on my finger, it doesn't recognize my fingerprint, it's not going to open. It's not the phone's fault, is it? It's programmed to work one way. It's my fault. I wonder if the Israelites had a hard time understanding whose fault it was was because a lot bigger difference, a lot bigger important thing than unlocking our phone is our relationship with God. And as soon as we start out life, by nature, our relationship with God is on the fritz, is going haywire. But whose fault is it? Who are we going to give the blame to? I wonder if the Israelites struggled with the temptation to give the blame to God, to say to God, The stuff you've given us to do, what you expect of us is just too much. You demand too much of us, God. Because look at their history. The moment that Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the book of the covenant law in his hands, it it didn't take long enough for him to hike down Mount Sinai than it took for Israel to forsake, completely destroy the very first commandment. You shall have no other gods. And how it was met with an obnoxious, a rambunctious display of idolatry. From the get-go, things are not looking good for Israel. And as you follow Israelite history, you know the story. They did not get really any better, did they? There were times when things kind of looked more positive, but Israel got certain kings. Those kings failed to listen to what God had to say about taxing their people, about making treaties with other nations. And eventually, Israel had a civil war and split from the northern northern nation of Israel, split by the southern nation of Judah. But both nations did not do that great of a job following God's commandments. Both nations were conquered by foreign oppressors and taken off into exile. None of this really worked, did it? The laws of the covenant, do this, God said, and you will be my people, and then I will be your God. Sounded great. It's just that Israel looked at what God demanded of them, and I think they probably said, God, you're asking too much. And the reason that I think they said that is because in my weaker moments, that's what I say to God. How about you? God, do you really expect me to be a servant of all? Do you really expect me to love my neighbor, even the ones that I hate, even the ones that hate me, even the ones that I don't think are worth, worthy of my respect or my fair treatment? God, do you really expect me to be humble, even though when, I, when I'm talking with someone and they're clearly wrong, I have to educate them, I have to show them that I'm on the moral high ground And I have to put them in their place, don't I, God? Isn't that right? God, your laws of loving you with all my heart, soul, and mind, and loving my neighbor as myself, that's too much, God. Sometimes we get frustrated. Like dangling a two-inch thick ribeye over a tiger in his cage, just out of his reach, 
like telling your kid that he can have an Xbox, you'll buy him one if he can keep your lawn alive all summer long. The task is too hard, even if the reward is so great. God said, you can follow, if you follow this law, I will be your God, and you will be my people. But we can't. In life, you have to have flexibility. We're not talking about being able to touch your toes. We're talking about mental flexibility. You meet your lunch date at Taco Cabana, but you see the sign on the front door, they are closed for maintenance. So, in your flexibility, you say, what, what about going to Boss Chicken instead? You have a wedding date on the calendar, but that date, for whatever reason, is no longer going to work out. You've got to be flexible. You can't go off the rails. You can't lose your cool. Just pick a new date. Is God mentally flexible? Sure seems that way, doesn't it? The way the covenant at Mount Sinai worked out, the way it was totally obliterated, by the Israelites, and it was totally their fault. It wasn't God's fault, and it's totally our fault that we can't follow the law. It's not God's fault. Does it seem like God is pivoting, changing plans, being mentally flexible? Okay, plan A didn't work. Let's try plan B. We'll see if that's how this sounds as I read Jeremiah again. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with my people Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people no longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. God is like the husband. And he says, We are like the wife. And it's like we cheated on him. It's like we broke the marriage vow. But God, being who he is, will remain faithful to his vows to us. We broke the covenant. We can't put that on God. That's not God's fault. He created us to have relationship with him. He created us to be his people. And we were the ones who failed. Yet God is willing to be both the hurt party and the healing party. He's willing to be the one that we've wronged and the one who makes the repair. God is going to give us a new covenant. But in what sense is it new? It's not a brand new invention to treat us not as our sins deserve. Grace and forgiveness is not something God cooked up in a lab when he found out that Mount Sinai wasn't going to work out for us. No, it's new in the sense that it is totally different from what Moses came down with that mountain with. This new covenant is not new in the sense that it came out of nowhere. This is as simple as God staying true to who he is. God is a God of grace. God is the God of loving the unlovable. God is the God of forgiveness. And so even though we forsook him and we sinned against him and we stabbed him in the back, he's going to take all of those mistakes and all of those sins and take them to the cross tomorrow night. He's going to crucify his own son. That's how much he loves us. That's how committed he is to you and me. And he says, I'm going to forgive your sins. I'm going to wash them away. I'm never going to remember them ever again. We human beings, we have a hard time forgiving and forgetting. You're hanging out with your buddy and all of a sudden you remember that time he stabbed you in the back and that hurt comes back and you got to forgive him all over again. God's not going to do that. 
He's not going to wake up one day and then remember your sins and say, hey, wait a minute, and then demand punishment from you. When God forgives your sins through Jesus, they are thrown away. They're not coming back. So far has he removed his transgression, our transgressions from us. Like As far as the east is from the west. Because God is not just interested in your obedience to some rules. God is not only interested in what your hands are doing, the actions you are doing. That's not a relationship. If you're at work, if you're on the clock, if you're sitting in the desk at school, then all anyone can ask you is to do as you are told. That's all that they can demand from you. Because you don't have a relationship with your boss or coworkers. Well, maybe you do, but it's not the normal thing. You don't have a relationship with your teacher. But what about a family or a marriage or a friendship? If you told your spouse, if you told your friends that you were only being nice, with, nice to them, you were only spending time with them because that's your job, because that's what you're supposed to do, that's not a relationship. And God wants a relationship with you. So he's not just coming after you for your obedience. He wants your heart and your soul. He wants to save everything about who you are. He's coming after your mind, this new covenant says. Sounds kind of like mind control. God does want to take over our thought life. He wants to be on our heart. He wants to be on our mind. But it's not brainwashing any more than me teaching you how to drive stick shift would be brainwashing. That's not brainwashing. That's giving you new information, opening your mind to new horizons. God is opening your mind to know him, to know him in a relationship way, to know him by his love. And that, brothers and sisters, is why he gives us communion. That is why Jesus gave his disciples in that upper room a way to celebrate his death for them that they had yet to see, a way to remember everything he had gone through for them, but not just that, not just to remember, but to experience again and again this new covenant, to experience God reaching into our hearts and changing us and strengthening our relationship with him, and changing even our minds. Through communion, we are communing with God himself. A good relationship, people say, is 50-50, is a partnership, but not, not with God. Your relationship with God is not 50-50. He, he puts up his half and you put up your half. No, God does 100% of the work. God did everything to make you right with him out of his love. You commune with God. You are in his family. But also, through the prophet Jeremiah, God paints this picture for us, this picture of a people who don't need to teach each other. There isn't a hierarchy of teachers and students. There's not inequality of any kind. These people, they interact. They don't have to say, know the Lord, because they already know God and experience his love together. They don't need to rehash old stuff, basic stuff, like how many books are there in the Bible, or how do you spell God's name, because they've moved on from that. They are in the deeper things together. Your faith journey with God is not just an individual thing. You not only commune with God, but as you will see visually in a couple minutes, you commune with each other. Because this picture God is painting for us through Jeremiah of a people who together know him and celebrate him and experience this new covenant kind of love, this picture becomes reality in us through Christ. Amen.